Good evening. You're watching the main news on ATV. I'm Emily Sue. And I'm Edna Zay. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Financial Services Minister relaxes key property cooling measure for home buyers but vows to keep other curbs in force. Acting Chief Executive warns of harmful trend of radical lawmakers blocking any government policy they don't like. Unprecedented electrical disruption as protesters force landfill discussion to be postponed. The government has relaxed one of its key anti-speculation measures to give home buyers more time to sell their first property without having to pay double stamp duty when they upgrade to a new flat. But the minister in charge has made it clear that all other curbs will stay in force, even though lawmakers are demanding further exemptions if the government wants the formal approval of the measures. Financial Services Secretary Chen Ka Kung confirmed the rumors that began yesterday, announcing two minor relaxations in one of the government's key anti speculation measures this afternoon. A double stamp duty plan was introduced last February as an added effort to cool the property market, as prices were still soaring after a previous round of anti speculation measures. Anyone buying property worth more than $2 million would have to pay double the previous stamp duty at a new rate ranging from 1.5% to 8.5%, depending on the price. Only permanent residents buying their first home would be exempt, and the new rates would apply to all buyers of residential and commercial property. Under the current rules, homeowners buying a second flat will have to pay the double stamp duty, but they'll get a refund if they sell the first home within six months of signing a provisional agreement. Chan today proposed that the six months should be counted from the signing of the final sale and occupation agreement, which means buyers will get an extra 30 to 45 days to sell off their old property. The stamp duty for one car parking space purchased together with the property will be exempted from the double stamp duty. Chan said the relaxed rules are aimed at helping genuine home buyers who want to upgrade their flats while maintaining the effects of the cooling measures to discourage speculation. He dismissed speculation that this signals further relaxation of the government's curbs, making it clear they're here to stay. If these measures are purely, you know, uh, uh, technical measures, you know, in, in fulfilling our original objectives, uh, which are welcomed by the committee members, and they are in no way uh, sending any messages uh, that the government is uh, uh, relaxing our, uh, our demand management uh, you know, policies. And I can say that uh, in, this day, in this days and age, when we are still facing a lot of uncertainty in the market, uh, both external and uh, you know, uh, internal, uh, we must remain very vigilant and uh, the government will not relax on our uh, demand management issues, uh, okay. measures. Today's move is seen as a bargaining chip by the government as it tries to secure lawmakers' support for the relevant bills that have yet to be passed to formalize the cooling measures, even though they're already in force. The government wants them approved by July before LegCo's summer recess, but lawmakers are not happy with the minor relaxations. <laughs> Independent lawmaker Lam Tai Fai accused Chan of being inflexible and questioned why the government is not extending exemptions to first-time commercial property buyers. Andrew Leung from the Business and Professionals Alliance said he is very disappointed and accused the government of damaging the business environment. Acting Chief Executive Carrie Lam has warned of severe consequences from a growing trend of radical lawmakers filibustering bills to block any policies they don't like. Lam said the ongoing filibuster of the budget bill will hinder the government's daily operations and public services are bound to suffer. Speaking before the weekly cabinet meeting this morning as acting chief executive, Carrie Lam warned that Hong Kong is edging closer towards a fiscal cliff with the budget bill still making no headway in LegCo. She said the $78 billion in temporary funding which the government sought two months ago will run out by the end of this month. The operation of government departments and the public services they provide will be affected as early as June, Lam warned. Financial Secretary John Zeng will host an emergency meeting this Thursday to work out contingency measures in case the interim funding runs out. Four radical lawmakers have tabled a record 1,200 amendments to the budget bill, arguing that it doesn't go far enough to help the needy. 
Their filibuster has forced LegCo to spend 30 hours in the past fortnight voting on slightly more than 20 percent of the amendments. Lam is worried about what she sees as a bigger problem. Individual lawmakers readily resorting to filibusters to block policies they dislike. She noted that the practice has spread to LegCo panels. A surprise filibuster by radical legislators last Wednesday forced adjournment of a public works subcommittee session on the government's latest funding request for an incinerator and expansion of the Zhengguanou landfill. Lam says she knows that one lawmaker is planning to table 700 amendments when the Finance Committee meets on Friday to discuss a government funding request for its controversial development projects in the Northeast New Territories. The acting chief executive warned of severe consequences if the filibustering culture spreads throughout LegCo. She said when a bill is held up in the Finance Committee, it affects other funding requests in the queue, delaying government initiatives for the needy. Lem cited paying one month's rent for public housing tenants and providing an extra allowance to welfare recipients as examples. She also pointed out there might be a need to retender public works project if the government can't get the money before the tenders lapse. I urge lawmakers to stop using filibusters to hinder effective governance, she said. Lam has expressed her serious concerns to the House Committee and asked the Rules of Procedure Committee to consider how to deal with stalling tactics. That committee met LegCo President Zhang yuk Sing behind closed doors this afternoon. No one can put any pressure on me to cut short the debate. I, I have to strike a balance between protecting members' rights to um, take part in a debate and in case a debate uh, uh, is protracted to such an extent that the um, effective and proper function of the legislature as an institution um, is being uh, impeded or is being um, uh, compromised, then I will have to make a decision whether the debate uh, should go on or not. But Zhang stopped short of saying what he considered to be too long. In an unprecedented disruption to LegCo proceedings, rowdy protests have scuttled the government's latest attempt to convince lawmakers to back the expansion of the Zhengguanou landfill. The meeting on the controversial proposal had to be adjourned for the second time in a week after being moved to another chamber to avoid protesters. ATV's Arthur Okaola reports. Zhengguanou residents returned to LegCo today to resume their emotional campaign against government plans to expand the landfill in their backyard. The protesters, led by Sai Kung District Councillor Christine Fong, shouted from the public gallery as Environment Secretary Wang Kam Singh and his aides attended a public works subcommittee session. Cheng Kwan O residents complained that it's unfair the dump in their neighborhood has to accept large amounts of waste from other parts of the city. The din was so loud that after 30 minutes, subcommittee chairman Lo Wai Kwok ordered a break to allow security staff to deal with the protesters. But the heckling continued during the recess. The demonstrators ignored warnings from security staff that they were breaking the rules. The meeting had to be suspended for an hour before resuming in a different chamber with the public barred from attending. But they created a commotion outside the room, kneeling and begging for the deliberations to stop. Some of them then tried to barge in before staging a sit-in outside. Inside the chamber, pan-Democrat lawmakers criticized the decision to close the public gallery, saying it was unfair to the media and non-protesters. Unionist legislator Wong Kwa King said reporters should be allowed in and expressed confidence that security staff could identify the protesters. His calls were ignored, but when the meeting got underway again, 
lawmakers still had to vote on dozens of motions moved by filibustering lawmakers. The motions called on the government to deal with residents' concerns before moving ahead with the expansion plans. The meeting was adjourned at 1 p.m. after time ran out. The subcommittee chairman explained that he had no choice but to allow all the motions to be voted on. If there are some difference in the wordings and a difference in the timing, then I have to consider whether they are really repeating the same motion or there are some new element in the, uh, the newly submitted motion. And because I have to make sure that the, the meeting can uh, be carried on, so um, I have to uh, uh, follow the uh, normal uh, procedures of the meetings in the LACHCO. It was the second time in a week that the meeting was adjourned. Last Tuesday, a surprise filibuster by two radical lawmakers and a rowdy protest in the public gallery forced the session to be abandoned. <laughs> LegCo President Tsang Yok Singh described today's disruption as unprecedented. But he refused to say whether the panel chairman had broken any rules by turning the session into a closed door meeting because of the public disturbance. Arthur Rakiola, ATV News. China's state television has shown a man in Beijing confessing to posting false information on a US based Chinese website in return for money over the past five years. Beijing police said the fabricated reports about human organ harvesting and other scandals had damaged China's image. ATV's Britain Clinic reports. This surveillance footage shows Xiang Nanfu at a Beijing cyber cafe, one of the places the 62-year-old used to allegedly post false information about the government on New York-based Chinese news portal Boishun. He wrote 1,000 stories since 2009, including one claiming that the Chinese government was harvesting organs from living humans and burying people alive. There was also an explosive report that the police had beaten a pregnant woman to death during a land dispute. Police arrested Xiang at his home in the capital on the 2nd of this month. Today he was shown on state television confessing that he had broken the law and regretted his actions. I did it for self-expression and money, said Xiang. Nothing was ever verified and sometimes I would fabricate or exaggerate information. Xiang said he realized his rumors had tarnished the government and the Communist Party's image. He ended his statement with a plea for leniency. The police said Xiang received large amounts in U.S. dollars for his work, but this has been denied by Boishun founder Watson Meng, who accused Beijing of extorting a confession. It's unclear how Xiang will be punished, but a jail sentence is likely. Under a new law, bloggers spreading rumors online face five years behind bars. The mainland has been cracking down on internet dissent in the lead-up to the 25th anniversary of the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown on June the 4th. Just last week, veteran journalist Gao Yu was detained for leaking state secrets to her foreign contacts. The 70-year-old journalist was paraded on state television with her face blurred and shown confessing to her crimes. Britain Clenet, ATV News. Beijing has slammed the U.S. for encouraging dangerous and provocative actions in the South China Sea as a territorial dispute with Vietnam widens. This comes after Washington's top diplomat accused China of aggressive acts and called for a regional code of conduct. ATV's Ben Arook reports. Vietnam released video today showing one of its patrol boats in a water cannon battle with a Chinese vessel in waters near the disputed Paracel Islands yesterday. The Vietnamese Coast Guard says the boat was attacked after it tried to approach a mainland-owned oil rig that was moved into the area last week, sparking protests by Vietnam and its ally, the U.S. Vietnamese media claimed up to 15 Chinese ships with water cannon tried to block a Coast Guard boat from reaching the platform and rammed it, causing damage and injuring crew members. Both sides accused each other of intentionally colliding with its ships, and the incident sparked anti-China protests on the streets of Hanoi. The U.S. waded into the spat, which it blamed entirely on China. All nations that are engaged in navigation and traffic within the uh, South China Sea, East China Sea, 
uh, deeply concerned about this aggressive act. Uh, we want to see a code of conduct created. We want to see this resolved peacefully. Beijing hit back today what it described as the latest in a series of mistaken remarks by U.S. officials on regional maritime issues. There is indeed a country taking provocative actions in the South China Sea, said Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Hua Chenying, but it's not China. She told the daily press briefing that Kerry's comment encouraged dangerous and provocative actions, and Washington should think about what role it can play in maintaining regional peace and stability. Hua said earlier that Foreign Minister Wang Yi phoned Kerry and explained the historical evolution, facts and truth about the issue and urged him to be more objective. She said Kerry responded by insisting the U.S. doesn't have a position on the sovereignty issue and will not take sides or pass judgment. Ben O'Rourke, ATV News. A popular seafood spot in Lei Yumen shut down today as restaurant operators protested against the government plan to convert two public car parks into private homes. They estimated a loss of $2 million in earnings today and warned of bigger losses to come. Britain Planet reports. Seafood lovers who ventured into the Lei Yumen fishing village today were in for a disappointment. 90% of the restaurants and shops there were shut. The action by 100 establishments was a protest against a government plan to build homes on two public car parks in the Kowloon tourist hotspot. The move outraged restaurateurs who argued that it will kill off tourism in the area because visitors will have nowhere to park. This, they fear, will lead to a 20% drop in business. They estimated that today's shutdown has cost them around $2 million in lost earnings. Demonstrators marched along the popular tourist venue before smashing plates to express their anger. Wong Ping Kun, a spokesman for the Safeguard Lei Yu Moon Car Parks Concern Group, complained there's already a shortage of parking spaces and the housing plans will reduce the 200 spaces on Lei Yu Moon Path to 40. If customers can't find a place to park, they will drive off to a restaurant elsewhere, he warned. The protesters claim they are not really against residential development, but they want the government to take into account the growing number of tourists in the area and the need for more parking spaces. Earlier this year, the town planning board approved the government's application to rezone the site for residential use. Preparation work has already started for the 370 flats that will be built there. The government has offered a nearby site as a temporary parking area while the homes are being constructed. But that's not good enough for the restaurant owners and traders. They want construction to be halted while both sides try to hammer out an agreement. The demonstrators have threatened more action, including a sit-in next month. Britain Clinic, ATV News. An Israeli court has jailed former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert for six years for corruption. Olmert, age 68, is the first former Israeli head of state to have a criminal conviction. He was found guilty of taking bribes from the developers of a housing project when he was mayor of Jerusalem and accepting bribes again in a separate property deal. Olmert is asking to be freed on bail while he appeals to the Supreme Court, a process that could take months. Corruption allegations forced Olmer to resign as prime minister in 2008. Nigeria has dismissed a deal to release prisoners in return for hundreds of schoolgirls kidnapped by Islamist militants. Instead, the country has accepted an offer of help from the U.S., which is now flying surveillance missions over Nigeria to hunt for the girls. Here's Banner Work. These are said to be the Nigerian schoolgirls who were kidnapped almost a month ago by Boko Haram, according to the latest video released by the militant Islamic group. They're being held in a secret location in Nigeria. In the video, Boko Haram leader Abu Bakr Shekau offers to swap the girls in return for the release of jailed militants. He had earlier threatened to sell his captives into slavery. But Nigerian authorities, who have been widely condemned for doing little to get the girls back, are refusing to negotiate with the militants. We are interacting with uh, uh, experts, military and intelligence experts from other parts of the world. So these are part of the options that are available to us and many more. 
That includes accepting help from the US, which has quietly been increasing its military presence in Africa since former President George Bush launched his war on terror. I can report to you that our inter, uh, interdisciplinary team with representatives from the State Department, Department of Defense, the FBI and others is up and running now at our embassy in Nigeria, helping to support the Nigerian government uh, by providing military and law enforcement assistance as well as intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance support. U.S. planes are said to be scouring the country looking for the schoolgirls. It's the first time America's controversial Africa Command is operating in Nigeria after Abuja refused to allow Washington to set up its regional headquarters there. Over at the UN, Western countries expressed outrage at the mass abduction. We have all condemned Boko Haram's recent attack against civilians and the abduction of more than 200 schoolgirls in Nigeria an act that has shocked the global conscience. Boko Haram is a mo morally repugnant organization committing vile acts of terrorism. Boko Haram has no agenda other than cowardice, sadism, ignorance and death. As such, it has made itself the adversary of people everywhere. The US has been accused of dropping the ball on Boko Haram for refusing for years to stick it on its list of terrorist groups, despite it being blamed for bombing a UN building in Abuja in 2011. Washington only added it in November. At the same time, the Nigerian government argues that the militant group is one of many that are mainly concerned with poverty and foreigners draining the country's resources than attacking America. Yesterday, another Nigerian militant group released three Dutch men they kidnapped three weeks ago after realizing they were filmmakers and didn't work for US oil giant Chevron. Ben O'Rourke, KTV News.